All right, today we're going to take a look at finishing up factoring polynomials, um, really just a continuation of our previous section of material. And um, we're going to jump back in um, at some point in this lesson to talk about the AC method. And you're going to actually see some, some value to it with the kinds of problems we see today, and you'll see why it's valuable. All right, so this is factoring when A is not equal to 1. All right, so when A is not equal to 1, and by that I mean like if you had the, fa the polynomial AX squared plus BX plus C equals 0, that's the A we're talking about. So the coefficient in front of X squared is the A. So when the A is not equal to 1, the first thing you should do is you should look to see if there's a common factor of everything. We did that in the last section. And if there's a common factor, you're going to factor that number out or that variable out or whatever. After you've seen whether or not you can factor anything out, what you're going to do with what remains, which may be the whole thing, is you're going to use either trial and error, which is okay, but if you don't get the trial to work and you're getting a lot of errors, it can get frustrating too. Um, or you can use the AC method, which tends to take a little bit longer, but you always end up at the conclusion in a specified amount of time. So there's like pluses and minuses to both of these, and we're going to look at both of them. So the first ones we're going to look at, we're going to do them with trial and error. So the first thing we should always do on the particular problems we have is to look and see if there's a factor in common to everything. So in particular, there's not a Y in every term, right? So I don't have any variables. But I have the numbers 5, negative 45, and 90. Are they all divisible by anything? Yes. 5. Yeah. So the first thing we're going to do when we have the ability to do so is we're going to pull out any common factors. So remember, this is like division. We're pulling the 5 out. We're dividing each term. So this becomes y squared minus. And then we have 45 divided by 5, which is 9. So 9y plus. And then you have 90 divided by 5. What's that? Close. 18. Yeah, it's 18. And feel free to grab calculators. No problem. OK. So this is what we have when we factor that piece out. We are not done. All right, we're not done, but we've pulled out the five that seemed to be causing some problems, at least a little bit, with the factoring, and that's very helpful. And the reason it's helpful in particular on this one is because what it does is it creates the y squared in front of it to have a coefficient of one, and then it looks just like the things we have did before. So there's no difference in this problem at this point than what we've done before. Um, it's trial and error, so what we're going to do is we're going to put our two sets of parentheses. These are y and y. That's fine. <coughs> And then remember what we did is we looked at the second values, uh, or the last value sign, it's positive. Positive means my signs match. If it were negative, it would mean I have one positive and one negative. This one means the signs match. And then I look at the sign in the middle to decide what they're going to be. They're going to match, and they're going to be negative. So the two signs that I have, using trial and error, are going to be negatives. What that means then, actually at any point here, the 18, is I need to know what things factor into 18. So 18 and 1 is always going to be an option, right, the number in 1. What other factors can I get for 18? 6 and 3. 6 and 3. What else? 9 and 2. 9 and 2 or 2 and 9, yep. And I think that's it. Now because my signs match, I want to pick the pair of these that will add up to 9, or specifically negative 9, in the middle. So which of these pairs of numbers gives me 9 if I add them together? The 6 and the 3. So 6 and 3 are what I want here. Okay, if the middle term had said 19, I'd have used 18 and 1. If the middle term had said uh, 11, right, 9 and 2, not 11, I would have used the 9 and the 2. So the middle term tells me which of these to pick. And I'm adding them because the signs match, right? So if I were to multiply these together, I'd get negative 6y and here negative 3y. And I would have them added together since the signs match. Negative 6 plus negative 3 would be negative 9. If the signs don't match, that makes things a little more difficult. But I'm looking to subtract the two values to give me the value I want. We'll see an example of that later. Okay, so this is our factoring and we're done. Okay, so when they have a common factor and then it turns into something we've seen before, there's not a lot of difference than what we've done before. 
That doesn't happen on our next example. There's no x in common to everything, and there's not a number in common to everything either. I have a 3, I have a 14, and I have an 8. They do not share a common factor except for 1, so there's nothing to pull out. So in doing trial and error, it makes it a little more challenging, and sometimes a lot more challenging depending on the values. I can no longer just put x and x at the beginning. I have to put something that multiplies to give me 3x squared. Now on this one, I don't have any choices. It's got to be, sorry, left off my x. It's got to be 3x and x. That's how I would get 3x squared. So that's actually fairly friendly because I don't have choices. It's 3 and 1. It has to be. Unfortunately, the number 8 at the end has choices. With 8, I can do 8 and 1, or I can do 4 and 2. Agreed? So I'm going to have choices at the end, and not only that, but I need to make sure my signs are right. Positive at the end means the signs match. match. Negative in the middle means they're both negative. negative. So I have something that's a negative and a negative, and I have four options, okay? So let's just pick one of them. Let's say that we pick uh, the eight and the one. We we'll just start at the top, and we try. We say, okay, let's try eight and one. The way I decide whether it works is that I multiply in the middle and I multiply on the outside and then I see if they add together to be the right value. So this is negative 8x and this is negative 3x. Will these combine together to give me negative 14? No. So what do I do? Well, I change them. It's not 8 and 1. Maybe it's 1 and 8. Okay, so we try it again. So now I have, change my colors here just a sec, negative 1x in the middle, that's too thick, and I have negative 24x on the outsides, right? Do those add together to give me negative 14? No. So I've gone through two things, like I put everything in as much as I knew for sure, and then I start doing trial. And I might just hit upon it the first time, and if I do, that's great, and we really enjoy that. Or I might be on time number three, or in this case, we're about to hit time number four if we don't get it right, right? So let's try another one. Uh, so we're using the four and the two, so let's just put them in that order, four and two. So this would give me negative four x in the middle and negative six x at the end. Did it work? No. So we're about to try our last option. If it doesn't work next time, it means that it doesn't factor at all, unless we've made a mistake. So this would be 2 and 4. So we have negative 2x in the middle. And what do we have on the outside? Negative 12x. Do those work? They do. We went through every possibility before we hit upon it, right? And that happens sometimes. Trial and error is much more difficult when you don't have ones at the beginning of your axis because you have more trial and error options to consider. Once you hit upon it, right, once it actually works to giving you the right terms in the middle, you're done. And you might be saying, well, why didn't I check to make sure I got the 3x squared at the beginning <coughs> and the 8 at the end? Well, we did, we just didn't say it right? We did that when we put the things in, right? The 3x and the x went in on purpose exactly like they were because that's the only way I could get 3x squared. And the 8 was achieved by me writing out all the common factors that would actually achieve an 8. So I've only tried things that would automatically give me the 3x squared and the 8. So I almost get those for free by the way I'm constructing my choices that I'm making. We're not trying just anything and everything. We're only trying things that are going to give me what I want at the beginning and what I want at the end, and then I'm trying to see that I get what I want in the middle. Okay? Still using trial and error. But now what do you notice happens that's different than the last one? I know the numbers themselves are different, but there's something else that's different that we haven't had yet. Negatives. There's a negative. In particular, there's a negative 2 at the end, right? That's going to make the problem different. Now... Trial and error, I'm still making my parentheses. It's actually still pretty nice that I have 7x and 7 being a prime number at the beginning. 
7x squared because there's only two things I can write in there. They have to be 7x and x. I don't have any other ways that can work. What's difficult about this one is that I have signs that don't match. And as I'm putting in the signs that don't match, I made a decision. I put the negative at the beginning and not at the end, right? And I'm not cheating to try to make it harder. I'm just putting them in randomly. So this may or may not work, right? It is just a choice we make. We put a negative, we put a positive, and we see what happens. Okay, so we're gonna leave the negative and the positive there. The nice thing about this one, unlike the last one, is there really is only one thing I can use. I have to use two and one. So I don't have, like I did in the last one, eight and one and four and two, right? I had four options, right, depending on the options. Here it's just two and one. So I'm gonna put a two and a one in and we'll see what happens. So we'll put the two at the beginning and we'll put the one at the end and we'll check the middle and check the end. So now I have negative two X at the end and I have seven X on the outside. What do I get? You get a 5x. Do I? Oh, sorry, 5x. I get 5x. The 5 is right. That's good news. It means we've almost got the right thing. Any idea what I need to do to get it to be negative instead of to be positive? Flip the signs. I need to flip the signs. So once I get the value right in the middle, even if the sign's wrong, right, the value is a 5, so it matches my 5, it means the numbers are all in the right place. It just means the signs need to switch. So instead, I need a positive here, and I need a negative here. And if I did that, I'd have a positive 2 and a negative 7, and then I'd have my negative 5. So this one, we happened upon the right answer a lot quicker than the last one, didn't we? We did. So that can happen sometimes. Still, it wasn't our first choice. But What about 4 makes it different? A is negative, yeah. It starts out with a negative in front of the squared term, right? Okay, so when that happens, we don't want to start factoring right away. We really want to do it much like we did over here with the first problem where we factored something out. We want to factor out the negative. We do not want the A at the beginning to be negative and then to proceed with factoring. It just makes, it's not this possible, it's not impossible. It just makes it more necess unnecessarily difficult, okay? So when you see a negative at the beginning, like this one has, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to factor the negative out, which will change all your signs. Okay, is that good? All my signs switched because I pulled the negative out. Now, I didn't check on 3 or 4, but clearly on 3, none, the constants in front didn't have anything in common, and same thing on 4, right? Except for the negative, the 3, the 4, the 4, they don't all have a factor that's in common besides 1. So there is no common factors that we can worry with. Um, but I can do my factoring now. And again, in some sense, this is really nice because I only have a 3 and a 1. I don't have any other choices. It's 3w and w. Okay, what signs am I going to have? Different signs. Different signs, right? This negative at the end in the factored form, the previous step, is a negative, right? The sign before the four. So I'm going to have one positive and one negative, and I recognize I might have put them in the wrong order. Unfortunately, I've got a four. Why do I say unfortunately? Well, because four can be four and one, but it could also be two and two. The more options I have, the more chance anyway I have of having the problem take longer. It still might not. This is trial and error. We always have the possibility that we just happen upon the right one early on, but we also have a bigger chance that we might not. Um, so which one do you want to start with, four and one or two and two? Four and one, you want two and two. Thank you, Simon. Okay, two and two. So Simon says two and two. We'll try two and two. Uh, the nice thing about two and two is that if this is wrong, there's no switching them, right? The two and the two match. So it's either right or the signs are backwards, or it's completely not gonna work at all. So we're gonna check the middle and the outside. And the inside I have two W. On the outside I have negative six W. Does it work? <coughs> I'm shooting for a four W, does it work? No, but it's close. What is it? What do I have right now from these two? Negative 4w. So I have the 4, but 
Gregory, what you were trying to tell me? Yeah, the sign's wrong. It should be positive and I have it negative so I can flip my signs. And we happened upon something that worked pretty quickly. This one's now negative, this one's positive. So now I have negative here, positive here. Do I have 4W? Yep. Yes, I do. So then this would be my factoring because my middle terms, my insides and my outside give me the right value at the bottom. Okay. So trial and error, it's not all bad, but sometimes it will lead us down a path that seems to take forever. And just imagine, the one we had that was the, the worst one for us was number two, uh, and it happened because we had um, an eight, and the eight meant we had to check the one and the eight, the four and the two, right? What if it had said 24 at the end? You'd have a one and 24, a two and 12, uh, a six and four, a three and eight, there'd be four possibilities, right? Four things you'd have to check, potentially, before you'd happen upon the right one, perhaps. And if the signs are different, it might even be more, right? So the problems can be quite complicated at times, and it might be something where you're like, you know what, I'm gonna do trial and error, and if I try a couple of things, I'm gonna be like, scrap that, give me something else. So let me show you the AC method, and then when you get to your homework, I don't care if you use it or not, it doesn't matter to me. If you wanna use trial and error all the time, that's great. Uh, I mentioned slide and divide before, if you know what I'm talking about and you know how to use it well, you can use it, but I'm not going to teach that as the method that we're gonna use, okay? If you don't know what I'm talking about, then just ignore it. Okay, we're gonna use the same problems that we did. These are problems two and three, but we're going to use the AC method instead. Okay, so I know it's been a minute since we did the AC method, about two weeks, in fact but let me remind you of the way it works. The AC method means that I take A and C and I multiply them. So in this case, A is three and C is eight. So what is three times eight? 24. 24. And then I consider what the B value is. What is my B value? Negative 14. Negative 14. Okay, everybody good so far? I'm gonna take the number 24. I mentioned it a minute ago. I'm gonna write down all the combinations of options that I have. So I could do one and 24, I could do two and 12, I can do three and eight, or I can do six and four. Everybody good so far? Those are all the ways that I can multiply two numbers together to get 24. And because the 24, I'm sorry, yeah, the 24 is positive, right? It says positive 24, it means my signs match. And I need my signs to be negative because B is negative. So what I really have is negative one and negative 24, negative two and negative 12, negative three and negative eight, negative six and negative four. That's what I really have, okay? And they multiply to give me positive 24, right? Okay, so which two when added together will give me negative 14? This one right here. This is the, this is the, the, the winner, this is the winner. Okay, so what do we do? Well, it works like this. We take that middle term, negative 14x, and we rewrite it as negative 2x and negative 12x in whichever order we like. So if you wanted to put the 12 first and I didn't, then by all means, do it. And you have plus eight at the end. So all we're doing is we're replacing the negative 14x with negative 2x and negative 12x. Those are equal, right? And then we're factoring by grouping, which we saw last time. The groupings are just where they are. That always works with these. The grouping will be where they are. 3x squared and negative 2x, what do they have in common? X. X. And if I take out an x, I have 3x minus 2. Is that piece okay? Just the first piece. Now my goal when I factor the second piece is to also get a parenthesis part that says 3x minus two, right? That's what I want, is it to look like this? What do 12, negative 12x and eight have in common? Four. Now notice, if I pull out only a four, I'm going to get negative 3x plus two. Is that what I wanted? No. How is it off? Because they have to match. They have to match, so what does it need instead? Yeah, so my signs are wrong, right? 
the signs are exactly opposite of what I wanted them to be. So instead of pulling out just a four, I'm gonna go back and I want it to pull out a negative four. And if I do that, instead of a negative three X, I have a positive three X. And instead of a positive two, I have a negative two. When you pull out a negative, all the signs change and that's exactly what I needed. I needed the signs to be exactly opposite of what they were. At this point, they match, which is what I wanted. And what we saw happen last time is that that means I can pull that out in front. So now I can write this as 3x minus 2, and then the pieces that are left over are in the other factored piece, x minus 4. So I, I hesitate to sort of claim like this is easier. I don't necessarily think that it is. But it is more scripted, right? It's almost like you have a step-by-step -step process that says this is how it's gonna happen every single time. There's no skipping steps, there's no making it faster or slower, it's always the same thing over and over. Some of you are like, yeah, cool, I like that. Some of you are like, nope, rather do it by trial and error. That's fine, it doesn't matter to me, but you have another option. So let's try number three, same thing. AC means I have seven times negative two, it's negative 14. The B is negative five. Okay, what options give me negative 14? Ignore the negative for the moment. What options just give me 14? Two and seven. Two and seven. What else? 14 and one. Yeah, 14 and one, or one and 14. And because I'm looking to get negative 14, I do need one of the two numbers to be negative. So even though I wrote down two and seven, I really have two choices. I have positive two, negative seven, negative two, positive seven, but I don't really wanna write all those out. But I do need them to have the subtraction of the two values, right? The difference of the two values to give me the negative five. So looking at two and seven and one and 14, which one has a difference, subtraction, of five? The two and seven do, right? So this is what I want. And I need to figure out where I want to put the negative. Well, do I want to put the negative on the two or on the seven to give me negative five? Seven. On the seven. So if I have positive two and I have negative seven, I will get negative five. That's the piece that's going to replace the negative five X in the middle. Simon. Could you also do seven and negative two? Would it come out to the same thing? If you do seven and negative two, your signs are gonna be wrong and you get positive five in the middle. Yeah, when you test it. And you'd know at the very end if you checked it, kind of like we were checking these over here, that your signs were off and you could switch them at that point too. It wouldn't hurt anything at that point to switch them. So if we take a look at this now, we have 7x squared. We have, again, it doesn't matter the order, so I'll do 2x and then I'll do, sub, sorry, it should be negative 7x. And then I have the negative 2. And we'll group. All right, so 7x squared plus 2x, what do they have in common? An x. So we'll pull out an x, which leaves me with 7x plus 2. How about negative 7x and negative 2? <coughs> what? X. Nope, they don't have x in common, these two. Oh, wait. Negative one, negative. Uh, a negative, right? They've got a negative in both of them, and I don't want there to be negatives, I want there to be positives. And so it's not just a negative, some of you are already saying it, it's a negative one, right? They always have one in common, negative one. And that will make them switch signs. So seven X and positive two will be here now. At this point, these match, right? So I write it down, seven X plus two. And then I need to collect the missing pieces. Well, the missing pieces are X, and minus one. And this is the point, Simon, that if you wanted to check to make sure that you didn't do it wrong, like, cause you can always check these. You can just check your middle term and your outside term. And you would see this is two X. This one is negative seven X. I do in fact get negative five X. And if you were wrong at that point, you could just switch the signs. Okay. Any questions on those? Cause we're about to shift gears. Okay, 
The other thing we're taking a look at in this section is called special factoring forms. There are a couple, no two or three, uh, just two here. There are a couple of different factoring forms. The first one, perfect square trinomial, it, it's valuable, but it's not super valuable right now. If you didn't learn the perfect square trinomial one that I'm doing right now, you, you could get by and it would be all right. You could still do all your factoring, you'd just do it the other way and it would be okay. However, the second one, the difference of squares, you need it because there's no other way to do it. So perfect square trinomial says the following. If I have a very specific form where it looks like uh, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, like the form of my values, I can factor this as a plus b quantity squared. I'll show you examples. Just jot down the notes for now, okay? This is the less important one. The more important one looks like this. If you have two squared quantities subtracted, notice this is a binomial, two terms, right? This one previous was a trinomial. All the ones we've done already today were trinomials. This one's different. If you have the difference of squares, it will factor as a plus b and a minus b. And if you take a look at multiplying these back out, you'll see why. The first terms multiplied give me a squared, and the last terms multiplied give me negative b squared. So that's fine. Why is there no middle term? Well, take a look at what happens when we try this sort of check step we've been doing on the other problems. In the middle, I get a b. <coughs> what do we get on the outside? Yeah, I get negative AB. And what happens when you add AB and negative AB? They cancel, it's zero. And that happens every time you have a difference of squares, which is why this factoring works. This is really important, and it's not just important for factoring. This comes back into play in many subsequent math courses that you may have opportunity to take. You'll see it, you'll see it come back again and again, okay, in different contexts. So it's an important factoring technique. So let's take a look at how it actually plays out in a particular problem. Okay, so the first one, number five, is an example of a perfect, uh, a perfect square trinomial. It's not a very exciting type of a problem, but I just wanna show you that it works. So could you do number five with trial and error? Yes. yes. Could you do number five with AC method? Yes. yes. Okay, so you don't have to use what I'm gonna show you, but it works. So if you take a look here at the beginning, I definitely have something squared. It's u. What do I have with 81? What is it in a squared form? Nine, yeah, nine. it is 9 squared. Okay? So it fits this sort of squaring business that this says. I have the first term squared. I have the last term squared. I have those. Uh, the middle term, in order to use this, has to be the two terms from the first and the last multiplied, which it is, right? 9 and u. And then it's supposed to be doubled, 2 times that. So it really is 2 times 9 times u in the middle, 18u. It fits the pattern. So if you happened to notice that this fit the pattern, what did it mean? Well, it means you could jump straight to factoring it as u and 9 with addition in the middle squared. You can do that. Could you do it trial and error? Sure. Could you do it AC method? Sure. Do you need this? No, you really don't. But it is a pattern that exists, so I want to mention it. The next two are far more important. Okay? They are binomials. Agreed? <coughs> They're binomials. They have two terms yep. instead of trinomials with three. So it should red flag you. Anytime you see something with binomials, your immediately thought should be difference of squares. It's gonna be a difference of squares. That's the only tool I have. When the only tool that you have that works with them at binomials is, is this, that's the only one you get to use. Like you don't have any choices, right? So what do you do? Well, in much the same way I identified the last one, we've gotta figure out what's being squared. So the second piece here, clearly the W is being squared. It's already written that way. But what do I have to do for 25? 
it's a five. Yeah, I have to factor it. And it needs to be factored into perfect square pieces. It has to be a five. So what do I do? Well, I write my two sets of parentheses. I put five and W in. And then what do I put between them? Plus and a plus and a minus, and it doesn't matter the order. You can pick. I don't care if you put plus first or minus first. That's it. The formula is really easy to use, but you have to recognize it, and you have to make sure you find the square rooted value, right? The 5 in this case. You can't write 25 plus w and 25 minus w. That's not what's going on. 7. What's being squared when I look at 25y squared? 5y. Yeah. There is a 5 and a y that are being squared. Right? How about the 49? Yeah, so there's a negative in the middle, but then it's 7 that's being squared, right? Mm -hmm. So the pieces that are being squared are 5y and 7. So my parentheses say 5y and 7, 5y and 7, and what goes between them? Plus, Plus and a minus, in whatever order you like. Okay, our last two are going to combine some of the techniques from this section into one particular problem, and we're going to do a couple of them. Number eight. First of all, as you look at this, you might be like, oh my goodness, she didn't tell me what to do if there's a value that's got, you know, used to the seventh. It didn't, but it did. Um, the first thing, very first thing in our lesson today was looking for what? What was that? Things, out Things we can take out. Like, we call them greatest common factors. Chase, do you see something I can take out? Uh, okay, I have u to the fifth in every single part of this problem. I agree. Anything else? Three there's a three. Okay, so there's a, both a three, because all of these are divisible by three, and a u to the fifth, and I have to start there. So, greatest common factor. This leaves me with u squared here. That's promising. That looks more like what we've been working with. In the middle, what do I get from the 30, 30, negative 30 u to the sixth? 10 u. Okay. Negative 10 u. Negative 10 u. How about the 75 u to the fifth? 25. 25. 75 divided by 3 is 25. Think quarters. Three quarters is 75 cents. Okay. The u to the fifth is completely gone. It was pulled out completely. At this point, these parentheses, the part that's in parentheses, you can go and use any method you'd like. You can use trial and error. You can use the AC method. You could potentially, if it fits it, use the perfect square trinomial. Let's do trial and error, because I think it works nicely enough anyway. So if I want to use trial and error, I start with two sets of parentheses. This has to be a u and a u. Tell me about my signs. They have to be the same. And what do they have to be? Negative. Negative. The same because it's positive 25 at the end, negative because I have negative 10 in the middle. Now I need two numbers that multiply to 25 and add to 10. Five. Five. They happen to match. This actually is a perfect square trinomial portion in this problem. We did it with trial and error. That's just fine. It's done. How about nine? Yep, there's a two that's in common to all of them. You bet. Anything else? Yeah, y squared. There's a y squared in common to all of them as well. So if I take out the two y squared from the six y to the fourth, what do I get? Y squared. That's part of it. Three. Three. Y squared. How about taking 20y cubed and taking out a 2y squared? 10y. What's my sign? Positive. Uh, how about 14y squared and taking out a 2y squared? 7. 
Okay. If you want to use trial and error, go for it. I'm going to use AC method here this time. Uh, this is not a perfect square trinomial. I can guarantee you that. Uh, it's not because the 3y squared is not a perfect square itself. So this will not fit to that anyway. Um, so the 2y squared at the beginning is part of my, my answer. I'm going to do the AC method for it over here. So I have A times C, and I'm using this factored piece as I'm looking. So the A is 3. The C is 7. What is 3 times 7? 21. My B value is 10. So what factors can multiply to give me 21? 1 and 21 is always an option. What else? 3 and 7. And if you look at your signs, everything's positive, right? So I don't have to worry about positives or negatives. Which of these two, that is 1 and 21 or 3 and 7, will add to 10? 3 and 7. 3 and 7. So I come back over here, and I would rewrite the 10y as 3y and 7y. And I'll factor these by grouping. So I have 2y squared at the beginning. 3y squared plus 3y, what's it common to that piece? 3y, actually, yeah. I'm going to do a bracket. 3y. If I pull a 3y out of 3y squared, what am I left with? Y. y. And if I pull a 3y out of 3y, what am I left with? 1. one. one. Thank you for not saying 0. We are left with 1. It's common. It's common. How about the next piece? 7y and 7. Take the 7 out. Yeah, take the 7 out. So 7y, take out a 7 I'm left with, y. and then a plus 1 as well. So we're almost done. This is 2y squared. I now have a y plus 1 in common, right? And then I have these pieces, the 3y and the 7, that need a home. So we'll group them together, 3y plus 7. And again, if you don't want to use the AC method, I don't care, it's fine. But it's there if you want it. Okay? Uh, we do have a quiz next time, so make sure um, we encountered this the last time of the quiz. Any formulas that we've been presenting in class, you should be memorizing them as you go. So like differences, squares, perfect square trinomial, and all that stuff. So make sure those are memorized.